Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. So I just wanted to uh, um, make a couple comments um, again about um, this series. Um, um, the last time we went from sometime before the formation of uh, the American Irish Society up until uh, close to around 1950, uh, about the middle of uh, the century, and uh, talked about some, some uh, changes in all of that period. Um, this time we're picking up about the middle of the century and uh, going to near the end of the century. Uh, as I mentioned the last time, there, there are a lot of things going on in, in AIS and uh, with irises in all of that period of time. And it's just impossible to, to really talk about all of it in, um, in an hour's time. So there are a lot of things that are left out. And unfortunately, that's just because of the time constraints and the amount of uh, space I have for this um, program. So if you see things that, and you will see things that I don't talk about, um, that's, that's part of that. So uh, I obviously just had to pick and choose. And so this is just part of my um, kind of take on uh, some of the history and uh, irises, but it's certainly nowhere near complete. Um, so what we, first want to talk about just a little bit is World War II. And we had the first World War in the first session and uh, uh, followed by a worldwide pandemic. And I think at the end of that pandemic in, in um, 1920 or so, people were really ready to, to be um, uh, getting together in, in groups and societies after um, staying away from each other for a couple of years, plus the, the four years of the war before that. And with World War II, it's sort of the same thing. During the war, there were, um, uh, of course, lots of soldiers gone, people working on, on uh, uh, all sorts of things here at home. And there were no AIS conventions during some of those war years. So it affected, it affected the American Irish Society, but most, most other things uh, continued. Um, so we get to the 1950s and um, 1950 itself was uh, sort of a transitional year. Uh, there were some changes in the uh, uh, regions of the American Irish Society and uh, there's in the, in the new uh, supplement to the AIS bulletin that will be coming out uh, in the next uh, few weeks. You'll notice uh, there's an article about uh, the, the sections by Jody Nolan. And um, in 1950, there were some, some changes. Um, the 1950 convention was in the brand new Region 21, which is where I'm at uh, right now. And it was in, Saint, in um, uh, Sioux City, Iowa that year. And um, uh, Blue Rhythm won the Dykes Medal. Um, Agnes Whiting was the hybridizer. And so that starts out uh, where we are right now. Um, some other things that happened just in the, in the first couple of, a couple, three decades of after uh, 1950. In 1971, the American Irish Society Foundation was formed. Um, in 1978, The World of Viruses uh, was uh, published, edited by B. Warburton. But in the 1950s and 1960s, just prior to that, there were several sections, AIS sections formed. And they were not around in the first, uh, um, the first 30 years of the American Irish Society, but in early 1950s, the first of those was uh, the Median Irish Society. And then, followed by uh, uh, the Siberian Irish Society, uh, the Spuria Irish Society, then the Society for Japanese Irises, and the Reblooming Irish Society. 
Uh, the Reblooming Iris Society, I think, started in about 1967. So those first two decades in, in this, um, after, after 1950, saw about uh, four or five of the uh, sections that we know a lot about now or members of, uh, those started in that period. And uh, that, was, that was a big thing because, well, like the Median Iris Society, there were four classes of irises the standard dwarf beardeds, intermediate beardeds, miniature tall beardeds, and border beardeds. And all of those then were, were uh, had, had awards um, for each of those classes of viruses. And the Siberian Iris Society had the Morgan Award, um, the Spuria Iris Society, the Eric Nice Award, and the Society for Japanese Irises, the Payne Medal. And then the Reblooming Iris Society started in 1967. So, that was uh, it was it was a period of growth uh, for the American Irish Society and uh, for um, uh, just just uh, a lot of changes and people people coming up with um, uh, their their takes their their uh, favorites of types of viruses and and uh, people people gathering in groups to specialize in various types of viruses. And so uh, the sections was a, was a big thing. Um, and I mentioned the world of viruses, 1978, uh, edited by B. Warburton. And um, B. Warburton was a, um, one of those people that was um, into everything. Really, she, she was a hybridizer. She, uh, uh, she introduced about 140 cultivars and almost all iris classes. Um, um, she introduced uh, irises, uh, one, I think there was one arrowbred and, and a couple border beardeds and uh, quite a few uh, intermediate beardeds, um, a Japanese iris, uh, Louisiana iris, several miniature dwarfs, a uh, few miniature tall beardeds, uh, about 30 Siberians. Uh, several species crosses, and a lot of uh, standard dwarfs, about 60 standard dwarfs that she introduced. Um, the only thing that I could find that she didn't get into really was um, she didn't introduce tall beardeds. So she did almost everything else except tall beardeds. Um, but she, she was very prolific in, um, in a lot of these other groups. Um, she was uh, uh, received the AIS Hybridizers Award in 1966. She was given the AIS Distinguished Service Medal in 1972. Uh, the British Irish Society gave her the Sir Michael Foster Memorial Plaque in 1975. Then in 1985, she received the AIS Gold Medal. And um, uh, then later, the Warburton Medal uh, was named in her honor, and it's an honorary award for overseas Irisarians. So she was a, an, a, a really important name um, in um, Iristom. Um, this, this picture at the bottom is one of her standard dwarf irises, blue denim, that she introduced in 1959. And um, I had that growing on a, on a rock wall in my garden, and that's a, that's a picture of blue denim. Uh, beautiful little, little iris, one of my favorite um, of the historic standard dwarfs. Um, as I mentioned, she edited the world of irises uh, with uh, her assistant um, editor, Melba Hamblin. She was also the editor of the Media Night for the Median Iris Society for several years. And she wrote the international column in the AIS Bulletin. So um, she was uh, uh, one of those people I wish I had met, but I didn't. And uh, um, she, I think she died in the mid 90s, um, but uh, B. Warburton was one of those important people that uh, uh, we're still, we still remember. So going back to where we were last time, and I'm just gonna continue a little bit on uh, some of those themes. Uh, we had talked about uh, reblooming irises, and so reblooming irises were not just tall beardeds, uh, but uh, pretty much in, in most classes of bearded irises and in, even in some, uh, some uh, beardless, there are uh, 
uh, Siberians that don't really maybe rebloom like uh, tall, like uh, bearded irises do in in the late summer or fall, but they are repeat bloomers, uh, some of them. So uh, you have that sort of a, a thing. This is Baby Blast from Lloyd Zerbreg, 1979. It uh, won the Cook Douglas Medal in 1989 for the best uh, uh, standard dwarf bearded that year. And um, it is a yellow standard dwarf from two remontant standard dwarfs, uh, or reblooming standard dwarfs. And uh, it's, it's a very reliable uh, rebloomer. And then Immortality in 1982, also by Lloyd Zerbrig. Uh, this was a ruffled pure white with a white beard. And it, it rebloomed summer and fall in Virginia and a lot of other places. Um, and and was, was a, uh, an important reblooming iris. Uh, Lloyd Zerbrig, and I'll just talk about him just a minute, uh, kind of specialized in reblooming irises. He was uh, actually the first president of the Reblooming Iris Society in 1967, and he received the AIS Hybridizer Award in 1992. Um, and he was another one of those uh, people who introduced irises in several classes, not just um, uh, tall beardeds like uh, Immortality, but uh, he, he introduced several, a few uh, arrow breads, uh, border bearded, IBs, intermediate bearded, miniature dwarfs, um, several standard dwarfs, uh, one Siberian, I think, and a species, and a lot of tall bearded, about uh, more than 150 tall bearded. Um, a really nice person. I met him in the um, just after 2000. I don't remember the exact year. I think it was the. Uh, the York Convention. Um, Lloyd was a music professor. He was from Canada and moved down to uh, into Virginia, North Carolina, and uh, taught uh, uh, music um, and retired. And uh, he had that year in the at the York Convention. Uh, he had a lot of his uh, seedlings were was in the Rebert Garden, I believe, and. Um, it was it was the day we were going to some of those gardens. I got on the bus. It was pouring the rain. Uh, everybody had their umbrellas and raincoats on. And um, I got on the bus, and he was sitting in the very front row. And uh, he saw I was by myself. And he said, uh, uh, do you have anyone to sit with? And I said, no. And he goes, well, sit with me. So I did. That's where I, that's how I met Lloyd. And um, so we talked about his irises. We got to the first garden. He, uh, we walked around and we got to the Reber garden. He gave me a personal tour of his seedlings in, in that garden in the rain. And um, so that was my introduction to Lloyd Zerbrig. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, um, great guy. I, the, the, the other thing I remember about him um, at that convention was at the final dinner, at the awards dinner, most of the people had left the ballroom and just outside the ballroom, there was a grand piano. And he started playing the piano and played Danny Boy for about 15 or 20 of us standing around the piano. And he sang, uh, sang as he played Danny Boy. It was, uh, it was one of those magical moments that you just uh, uh, hear about, but uh, uh, had to just pass on that little piece of information. He was uh, he's a great guy. And then uh, other, other rebloomers, Violet Returns uh, from Earl Hall, 1988. And um, this one is a great grandchild of Gibson Girl. And if you saw the, we're at the first session, uh, we ended the, the um, reblooming part of that with Gibson Girl. So this was a grandchild of Gibson Girl and a strong, reliable rebloomer in colder climates. And then Clarence. Uh, again, this is Lloyd Zerbrig uh, that introduced Clarence in 1991. Um, this iris uh, eventually won the uh, Worcester Medal in 2000. And uh, it's a Luminata amina. And the Luminata is uh, because of this white area without color, without striations um, around the beard. 
And the beard is also very, very light or white. And um, so that's, that's the Luminata part of it. And that's a, a simplified description. It gets very complicated when you really get into the, the uh, a description of Illuminata, but that's a rather simplified um, look at it. I, I think of it as a light in the center um, of the iris, but um, anyway, this iris reblooms from early August on in Virginia, and it reblooms in most of our gardens um, uh, at some point. It's named for Clarence Mahan, and Clarence Mahan was the uh, 22nd president of AIS, and he was also a president of the Reblooming Iris Society. So um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a great iris for a uh, um, a wonderful person named for a wonderful person in, a, in a, as well, and a very uh, talented and and um, important person in AIS. And then I'm um, going to end this part of it with um, a Constant Companion. And um, Constant Companion is an intermediate bearded iris uh, from Connell Marsh here in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was introduced in 1995. And it's an IB that has uh, rebloomed continuously for three months in Nebraska. That was the comment when he first introduced it. And it reblooms till hard frost. It's a reliable rebloomer. It uh, reblooms for most of us here that have it in, in Nebraska, uh, reblooms every year. Um, it has uh, uh, several Zerbrig irises in its background. Um, Sign of Leo, Violet Classic, Violet Miracle, Violet Supreme, Jolly Goliath. Um, it's also the progeny of uh, Third Charm, which is a 1982 reblooming standard dwarf bearded iris from John Weiler, who at the time was, was in California, and, um, and a tall bearded Violet Miracle. So um, I think this, this iris was also featured on the cover of the reblooming uh, Iris Society's uh, reblooming recorder at one point. So um, another great iris from about 1995. And then moving to white irises that we were talking about last time and uh, went, went through a good number of uh, older white irises. And this one is just after the turn of the century from 1955, uh, Tell Muelstein and Swan, ba Swan Ballet. And it won the Dykes Medal in 1959. So there have been several white irises and there's a couple more yet to come that have won the Dykes Medal. Um, so white irises, almost as I think I mentioned last time, almost every hybridizer has introduced a, uh, a white iris or two or three. So it's, uh, it's one of those uh, color, uh, colors of irises or, or irises that you, um, you see quite a few of them. Um, some people really like white irises. They do, um, in, in the garden, they, they are great for next to color irises. They, they give them a, a, a real background. So um, Henry Shaw by Cliff Benson, 1959. Um, this was the first winner of the Clara B. Rees Cup for white irises. And we mentioned Clara B. Rees the last time and um, her work with, uh, with white irises. Um, and she, she introduced several white irises. And then AIS uh, named the, uh, the best white iris each year for a few years um, in the Clara B. Rees Cup. And this is the first winner of that. Um, Henry Shaw was a philanthropist and uh, benefactor of the Missouri Botanic Garden in St. Louis, I believe the uh, early supply gave the land for uh, at least a large part of the Missouri Botanic Garden. And, and a lot of other uh, places and um, organizations in St. Louis. He was a great philanthropist there. Winter Olympics, um, another iris, white iris that won the Dykes in 1967 and the Clara Rees Cup in 1966. And this is by Opal Brown, uh, another great hybridizer. And this is one of her best uh, uh, white iris. 
and Shriners, of course, have, have had uh, white irises. And this is Christmas time. And um, this is one of the best red bearded whites, a uh, product of May Hall and Arctic Flame. And we talked about those uh, last time. Uh, about one fourth snow flurry, one fourth new snow. Um, and that was H.M. Parker said that in October 1970. So it has a, a, a great background from other uh, important white irises. Um, Christmas time is in the background of Monty Byers' Mesmerizer, which also won the Dykes in 2002. And we'll talk about some of Monty Byers' irises um, somewhat later in this session. But uh, uh, that iris, Mesmerizer, is a, another great white iris that won the, uh, won the dikes. And then moving to Siberian irises, and we talked a little bit about um, Siberian irises the last time, and there really were, were uh, a few um, irises that were quite important uh, in the early years, Caesar's brother being the most well-known, and still is probably one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known Siberian iris uh, uh, in the United States. But after the turn of the century, uh, after the, the middle of the century, we had a, some, some really great breaks in uh, Siberian irises, and one of those was White Swirl in uh, 1957 from Fred Casebeer. And this iris changed um, Siberian irises. It, it, um, uh, it had flaring falls. Most of the Siberians before that had very pendant falls. This one had flaring falls. Um, it was a transitional iris to a fuller, rounder, flaring form. And uh, a lot of hybridizers used it in developing new irises in various colors. Um, so there's a tremendous number of later Siberians that have white swirl in their background. This iris won the uh, Morgan Award in 1962, and then the Board of Directors Award in 1987. I'll mention the Board of Directors Award again in a, a, a few slides. Uh, but this was probably one of the most important Siberian irises. Um, um, in the entire century. So white swirl. And then the, another big uh, change uh, that happened in um, the, about 1970 is that Courier McEwen um, introduced Orville Fay and Fourfold, Fourfold White. Uh, that those were his first two uh, tetraploid Siberians. He used colchicine to double the chromosome number in Siberians. And um, that hadn't been done before with Siberians. It had been done with some other plant groups like daylilies. Um, and Orville Fay um, was one of those people that uh, uh, we'll talk about him a little bit more, but he was the one who had, had already been doing some work with colchicine in daylilies and um, Courier McEwen um, found out how he was, what he was using and how he was doing it. And he tried it, decided to try it with um, Siberians and it worked. And with, when you get tetraploids um, from, from colchicine, um, changing them from diploids, you get bigger flowers, more robust plants, uh, brighter colors and heavier substance. And so these were the first two, and since he had, he had uh, learned the technique from Orville Fay, he named that first one Orville Fay in recognition. And then the, uh, the, the third big uh, uh, development in the uh, first couple of decades after 1950 was um, Butter and Sugar, and again from Courier McEwen, 1977. And this uh, was the first non-fading rich yellow amina, uh, which is a, a lighter white, white standards and colored falls. Uh, the first non-fading rich yellow amina in the 20, 28 chromosome Siberians. Now, this is a diploid, 
but it uh, uh, was a thrilling color break in Siberian. So this opened up the whole uh, gamut of uh, uh, irises to come later that have uh, yellow. And from, from that, a number of other colors uh, came about. So butter and sugar was, was a really important iris, Siberian iris, uh, won the Morgan Award in 1981. And then in 1985-86, uh, they changed to a uh, uh, metal uh, system for Siberians and it won the Morgan Wood Medal in 1986. The Morgan Award was equivalent in all of these classes, uh, whatever class, if it was uh, the Morgan Award the, uh, for Siberians or the Payne Award for Japanese or um, any of the classes, if it was the award, that was equivalent to an award of merit. When we went to the medal system, that was a step above the award of merit. And so in 1986, it, um, this iris also won the Morgan Wood Medal because of its importance. Courier McEwen, um, this is a, a, a photo of him in his garden in Harpswell, Maine. And uh, as I mentioned, he developed a tetraploid Siberians. He also developed tetraploid, tetraploid Japanese irises, both using colchicine. And, um, he introduced something like 56 Japanese irises and about 115 Siberians, and he also had tried a little few eight, eight bearded irises. He authored books on both Japanese irises and the Siberian iris, and those books are still uh, 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 considered the books on those two, two um, um, non-bearded irises. He received the AIS Hybridizers Medal in 1976. He was honored with the Foster Memorial Plaque from the British Irish Society in 1977. He received the AIS Gold Medal in 1999. Um, Curry McEwen was a physician. He was a rheumatologist and um, uh, became the Dean of Medicine at, the, at New York University uh, at a young age. At the time, he was the youngest Dean of Medicine in the US. Um, he was dean from 1937 to 1955. He started hybridizing uh, rather late in life when he was 60. But um, he lived to be 101. So he, he had over 40 years of, uh, 40 years of working uh, as, a, as an iris hybridizer. He retired in 1970, moved up to his home in Harpswell, Maine. Uh, he passed away in 2003. Uh, but in his life, he had done some amazing things, and you can read stories about him managing hospitals for casualties during World War II. He worked with Albert Einstein in the late 1930s um, to rescue Jewish doctors and scientists from Nazi Germany by giving them appointments at New York University. And so he was an amazing person. Um, I met him... Uh, and I forget exactly when it was, 1998 or 99. Um, he, it was in Portland, uh, Oregon. He traveled to Portland and uh, the Japanese, I, I believe it was the Japanese Irish Society Convention. And um, he received uh, uh, a, an award there and he walked up to the, to the stage, gave a little talk. And at 90, 98 years old, he was still doing that. Um, it was it was absolutely amazing. So an incredible an incredible man. Um, I wish I had known him better, uh, but just met him that that one time, and uh, uh, he he really did a lot for a great deal for uh, Siberian and Japanese irises. Uh, Pink haze. This was. Uh, by William McGarvey, 1980. And uh, this one won the Morgan Award in 84 and the Morgan Wood Medal in 98. Um, this iris has white swirl in its background that we just talked about a couple minutes ago. And uh, Dr. McGarvey introduced about 30 Siberians. There were a good number of uh, well-known Siberians that, that uh, uh, 
Dr. McGarvey introduced, including uh, Esther CDM, Gull's Wing, Ego, Super Ego, um, I, uh, Id, um, Augury, Roanoke's Choice, a bunch of uh, really nice Siberians. And um, I have to say that I, as far as historic Siberians go, um, Pink Haze is probably my favorite among the, the uh, historic Siberians. Um, it's now 40 years old, um, but it's a wonderful iris. It's very dependable, makes great clumps. Um, if I had to choose just one historic iris, it would probably be Pink Haze, a uh, historic Siberian. So, um, and then uh, another thing that happened was um, Ben Hager and uh, I think later on some other people uh, brought some irises over from Japan that were um, Six Falls Siberians. And uh, uh, just a couple of those um, are Helicopter by Hoshidara, 1988, and Rikugi Sakura, also by Hoshidara. Both of those were, uh, were introduced uh, by Ben Hager for uh, Ho Shadara. And um, they're great little irises. And these irises, uh, there, there are others, Ranman and um, Keto No Siza. There, there are a variety of, um, of these um, irises that came from Japan. But hybridizers just started using them. And you see later on um, uh, doubles coming from some of those and some other uh, flatties or, or um, Six Falls. Siberians. Um, so there's another interesting uh, development in Siberians that came from um, uh, Japan. Uh, another thing that happened along the way um, was uh, Jim Waddick brought back seed from China for Iris typhifolia, which is the third uh, 28 chromosome species. Um, and the other two were Iris sanguinea and um, Iris siberica. And this uh, third one was a very early blooming uh, Siberian iris, so it, it imparted that into its um, um, progeny. So it gave us uh, earlier Siberians, and there's still people that are just, just working on that. Um, so there have been a huge number of changes uh, in Siberians, and the, it has transformed the the whole um, series of, of um, Siberian irises from what we saw previously in the, uh, the first session before 1950. Um, and I mentioned tetraploids. Well, this is Strawberry Fair, and um, this is by Bob Hollingworth, uh, 1994, uh, an absolutely sensational iris. And um, look at those, those horizontal falls. Uh, flaring falls. It was a, it's a tetraploid. So uh, Bob has worked both with tetraploids and dip, diploids. Um, this was a cross using pink haze uh, in its background. Uh, pink haze, wing on wing, and jeweled crown, which was another of uh, Bob's introductions. And this was the first Siberian with uh, bubble ruffling. Um, a great Siberian, and it won the Franklin Cook Cup in 1994, which is um, at conventions, that cup is given for uh, the best out of region um, iris uh, as seen by the attendees at a convention. And uh, Siberians have won a few of those. I think uh, uh, four of them or something since, uh, since this one. And uh, Strawberry Fair won the Morgan Wood Medal in 2001. Um, so that's where we're, we're kind of stopping uh, with Siberians, that Siberians continue uh, beyond this in so amazing color patterns and uh, uh, flower forms. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a great group of viruses with a, a tremendous number of changes since uh, 1950. Uh, and I mentioned the AIS Board of Directors Award. 
Um, and White Swirl, we talked about White Swirl from Fred Case Beer in 1957. That the uh, AIS Board of Directors Award is, was given to irises that uh, were uh, groundbreaking irises, but that did not get the rec recognition of receiving the Dykes Medal. Um, so they felt that there were these irises that were so important that they should have an award um, recognition for them. And White Swirl was given that recognition in 1987, um, and that was a Siberian iris. Uh, the only two, the only other two that I know of so far that have, have received that uh, award from the Board of Directors is Tobacco Road, which is a tall bearded by uh, uh, Rudolf Kleinsorge in 1941. Uh, it was high, introduced in 1941. And Snow Flurry, another tall bearded, and that was. Uh, of course, we talked about Snow Flurry by Clara B. Rees, uh, who, which she introduced in 1939. The award was started about 1986, and there's only three irises awarded um, so far. Then in the, um, about the, near the end of the first decade in the um, 2000s, um, it had been a number of years since we had given the award, and it was, uh, there, there were, issues about it, you know, what, how do we go forward from here and that sort of thing. And the AIS Board of Directors discontinued the award. But just last year, the award was reinstated in 2019. So uh, just to give us some idea about uh, what might happen, you can be thinking about uh, what irises might qualify for that award. And there are, there are a number of them, but um, so far there's only been three. And so I just wanted to, to mention that and we'll see what happens going forward. I talked about Orville Fay last time and then a couple times this, this um, session. Uh, Orville Fay uh, received the AIS Hybridizers Award in 1952. He was honored with the Foster Memorial Plaque from the British Irish Society in 1959. He was the hybridizer of a number of groundbreaking irises, including uh, New Snow, Cliffs of Dover, Arctic Flame. Um, we talked about all of those uh, white irises uh, last time. He followed those up with Two Dykes Medal winners, Truly Yours and Mary Randall. He was also the uh, uh, pioneered the use of colchicine inducing tetraploidy and daylilies. And then, as I mentioned, Curry and McEwen learned that technique, technique from Orville Fay and um, uh, named his first tetraploid Siberian iris for Orville Fay uh, in 1970. Um, colchicine is a drug that uh, rheumatologists use to treat gout. And um, it's one of those uh, drugs that has what we call a narrow, ther narrow therapeutic index, which means that there's a just a, a small difference in dose from where it's uh, uh, therapeutic in treatment and to where it becomes toxic. So it's a, a um, can be a dangerous uh, drug to use if it's not used correctly. And it's also, um, you need to be very careful with it when you're uh, using it in inducing tetraploidy in, in irises as well. Um, I, as a pharmacist, I've, I've seen prescriptions where physicians will write a, uh, uh, write a prescription for colchicine and they'll say, um, uh, you know, give one tablet twice a day um, until the pain is gone or they, they, the patient uh, has vomiting. So it, it's, it can be a toxic, toxic drug and uh, um, somewhat, somewhat dangerous to use if you're not familiar with it. Um, but Orville Fay was using it for inducing tetraploidy. And as I mentioned, Dr. Curry McEwen was a rheumatologist. He had been using the drug to treat patients. And um, so he was quite familiar with it. So the pink irises, this is one of those uh, irises that Orville Fay 
introduced Mary Randall, which went on to win the Dykes Medal in 1954. Um, it was a self of Bengal Rose with, with a red beard, um, and it, it lists the, the parentage there. So Orville Fay had, had um, a couple of dykes um, in pink irises, as well as his work with, uh, with white irises and, and uh, everything else that he introduced. Uh, then pink taffeta. Uh, from Nate Rudolph in 1968, won the Dykes in 1975, and he, he obtained this one by using uh, Fay seedlings to get this pink. Um, and I have to say, this was the first pink iris that I ever purchased. Uh, I think I got this from um, uh, Shriners back in the mid 80s, and uh, uh, with, a, with a, uh, a bunch of viruses I ordered from them. Um, pink taffeta was one of those. Beautiful pink iris. And then Vanity, Ben Hager, 1975, won the Dykes Medal in 1982, and it was a cross using pink taffeta. And then uh, right after that, Ben Hager followed that up with Beverly Sills, another Ben Hager introduction, 79, won the Dykes in 85. And he, he, re, he obtained that cross using vanity. Um, so the pink irises uh, up until 85 were, uh, this one is really ruffled. Uh, and I, I should say also, Ben Hager is one of those people that I should probably have put in here as a discussion point. He hybridized uh, irises in every possible class of viruses. He won the top award um, in every single class of virus that was available to him at the time. Um, there were a couple of, of uh, award medals given after he stopped uh, uh, hybridizing uh, near the end of his life and he um, didn't get the chance to, to receive those, uh, just a couple of top awards in those, but everything else he hybridized in every single class of virus and uh, managed to win the top award in those. So um, an amazing hybridizer. Um, moving to aminas, and um, aminas are uh, irises with a, a white, with white standards and colored falls uh, for the most part. There's all, there are also reverse aminas and um, that sort of thing. But, uh, this was whole cloth, and uh, from Paul Cook, 1956, Dykes Medal, 1962, um, another one of those groundbreaking irises. Um, and if you started looking at the numbers of irises that have whole cloth in their background, it would be astounding. Uh, it's just a huge number of irises that um, um, go back to whole cloth. So a very important iris. Um, and I, we talked a little bit about Gene Stevens' irises last time, and this is Finest Hour, uh, another wonderful amina. Um, Pinnacle, which we showed before, was a yellow amina. And, um, and a variegata bred red seedling are in the background, or in the background of Finest Hour. Um, this is, I think, one of, one of her uh, uh, most amazing um, irises. She did so much for um, Aminas. And another of hers was Sunset Snow, Sunset Snows, 1963, and this was from her original pink Amina strains. Beautiful iris. Um, this is not a very good picture, but uh, it's really uh, one of the uh, pictures I didn't have very many to choose from. This is um, Jean and Wallace Rex Stevens. Um, they were from New Zealand. And I put this in here partly because of the uh, work with Aminas that she did that was very important, uh, but also just to uh, mention the international scope of the American Irish Society. Um, you know, AIS from the very beginning was international because, uh, partly because, the American Irish Society are the um, international registrars of all irises in the world. So uh, that, that 
imparts a, um, a great deal of um, uh, international scope to the American Irish Society. And um, so every hybridizer throughout the world have to uh, register their irises with the American Irish Society. And so I, I wanted to just um, point that out um, Gene Stevens was the, the president of the New Zealand Irish Society from uh, 1949 to 51, and again from 1956 to 57. She won the uh, Foster Memorial Plaque from the British Irish Society in 53, and the American Irish Society gave her uh, its hybridizer medal in 1955. So uh, AIS uh, does give uh, the hybridizers medal not only to American hybridizers, but um, to international hybridizers. And another amina that uh, uh, was quite important was Dream Lover. This was from Esther Tams, 1971, went on to win the Dykes in 70, 1977. And then we talked a little bit about black irises uh, and the evolution of black irises last time. And uh, there were several nice ones up, uh, going up to 1950. And then from then on, there have been a, a great deal of black irises since then. And several people have had entire lines of black irises. Um, Gordon Plow uh, was one of those who had a, a line of, of very dark, uh, black irises. And most of these black irises are either a red black, blue black, or purple black, um, but are, are very, uh, very, very dark irises. Eden Knight uh, was in 1959. Sable Knight, which we talked about last time, was a, a pollen parent. And um, I, I've had this iris for a number of years. It's actually one of my favorites. It's uh, for historic iris. It's a great iris. And uh, uh, just a color that is diff rather difficult to uh, um, depict. Then Study in Black, another from Gordon Plough's uh, line of uh, very dark irises, 1968, won the Award of Merit in 61. Eden Knight was in its near background. And a third from Gordon Plough was um, Interpol. And um, study in black was uh, uh, a study in black sibling was the one of the grandparents of Interpol. Uh, really, really dark, especially early in the morning when it first opens. And then Orville Fay, uh, which we just talked about, he had uh, some black irises. This was black swan. Sable Knight was a pod parent. So Sable Knight turns out to be a, a really important uh, iris for. Um, future black irises. And then the Shriners uh, have, have had a long line of black irises, um, even up to, to uh, current um, introductions. Uh, this was Storm Warning uh, from uh, Bernard Shriner, 1953. Uh, this is one of their earliest black irises. And it, uh, it received the uh, Honorable Mention Award in 1954. But from this one, uh, they, they have um, produced a, a great line of uh, black irises. Uh, Licorice Stick then came along in 1961, won the Award of Merit Award in 64. It was a progeny of Storm Warning. And then Night Owl from Shriners, 1970. Uh, a grandchild of Storm Warning. And Superstition in 1977, uh, Award of Merit in 81. And Dark Side, another Shriner, uh, 1985, um, Storm Warning, Sable Night, and Titan's Glory, all in the background of this iris. And then Sterling Innerst uh, came out in 1989 with uh, Before the Storm. And this iris won the Dykes in 1996. And uh, its uh, parentage were, was a Shriners by a Plow Black. And um, um, included in that, I think it was uh, Superstition. The, the Shriners iris was Superstition uh, from 1977 with uh, by Raven's Roost, which was uh, 
uh, Plow's 1981 black iris. So it had, uh, had great parents and won the dikes. Then Hello Darkness in um, 1992, won the dikes in 99. This was the culmination of a series of, of great Shriner black irises. Um, and, and then continues on from there. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, we talked about some of the sections and uh, the early sections, there were about five of them or so. And then there were, were uh, several more after that, the Dwarf Iris Society and um, Cigna, the Species Iris Group North America uh, came along. Um, and then there was HIPS, which is the Historic Iris Preservation Society. And uh, HIPS says that an iris becomes historic 30 years after introduction. So all irises eventually become historic. And just so you know, Dusky Challenger was introduced in 1986 by Schreiner. So Dusky Challenger, which is at the very top of the popularity pole or the uh, uh, Tall Bearded Symposium, is now a, a historic iris. So. Uh, HIPS is one of those groups that uh, it's a section that has been doing a great deal of work, especially in um, the last few years, um, but it just started in 86, um, actually 80, I think 89 it started. Um, and uh, so it's 30, 31 years old, it's historic itself now. So, so um, HIPS has been doing a, a great deal of work in preserving uh, irises, not just the really old ones, but um, newer irises that, you know, in, in the, the classic eras of the 70s, 80s, and 90s now. Um, spuria irises. We talked a little bit about a, a couple of spurias the last time and continuing on from that. This is Dawn Candle from Walker Ferguson, 1965. It won the uh, Eric Neese Award in 1968. And then Port of Call from Ben Hager. As, as I mentioned, Ben Hager won the top award in, in uh, every, every class of iris uh, nearly. And this, he won the Eric Neese Award with this one in 1972. Highline Lavender, Eleanor, Eleanor McGowan was another great Spuria iris um, hybridizer. And uh, she introduced this in 68 and it won the uh, Eric Neese Award in 71. Cinnamon Stick from Dave Neiswanger. Dave Neiswanger has won the Eric Neese uh, medal um, a number of times. Um, this one was, uh, he won the medal and uh, the award in 1990 when it was uh, a word of merit uh, about that status and then changed to the medal and he won it for this same iris in 95. Um, it was introduced in 83 and he's introduced a, a, a great number of wonderful spurry irises since then. Dress Circle, another from Ben Hager in 1985 and the Eric Nies, uh, Award in 92. And then um, there's a couple of, uh, I'm going to uh, end a little bit with a couple of, of uh, groups of viruses that are really going to introduce a little bit of um, uh, Bonnie Nichols uh, programs in August. And the first of those are broken color um, or variegated flowers. And I'll just talk a, a few minutes about that and then um, we'll go to another group. But this is a broken color from a very, very old one, um, 1929 kaleidoscope from Cat Comier. And um, the falls are broken color. The standards are uh, mostly um, clear. But moving up to uh, past 1950, where broken color really, uh, really got. Uh, moving was, um, this was humoresque from Keith Keppel, 1962. Um, so Keith was even uh, introduced, introduced a broken color or two back then. And uh, so you can, you can see the form from the 60s is, is very typical of that era, but um, broken color. 
And then Alan Ensminger uh, really got involved in uh, what he called variegated flowers. He didn't use the term broken color, uh, but this is purple streaker. And um, he introduced this in 1983 and then uh, uh, a number of others after that. And he was um, credited with really popularizing um, variegated flowers or broken color. Uh, one was uh, Maria Tormina that he introduced, and this was his first variegated pink iris. Um, and Maria Tormina has, uh, has been used a great deal in hybridizing um, to get other broken color irises. Um, interesting thing about the name Maria Tormina, uh, it's named after a woman in Italy and Alan never met her, but um, she, would, um, she would order irises from him every year. And because of the international um, uh, exchange of money and that sort of thing, he would send her irises and she would send him Italian chocolates. So he uh, continued that for several years and it got to be uh, such a, a, a warm um, uh, exchange, the irises for the chocolates, that he, when he introduced uh, this broken color iris, he named it for her, Maria, Maria Tormina, but he never met her. But that's, that's the story behind the name. And then Batik. Um, Alan introduced Batik in 1986. It won the Knowlton Medal in 1992. And um, this is probably one of the most um, well-known um, irises that there are. Uh, somebody did a, a study a few years ago in just popular gardening magazines, you know, um, and the ads that people found in things like um, home and house and garden or that sort of thing. And uh, Batik was uh, uh, the most advertised iris that was, was found in, in those just general popular uh, gardening magazines. And I, at, uh, several years before Alan died, I uh, was talking to him about this. And he, he says, well, what he couldn't figure out is how, where they got all of their stock of Batik, because it never, um, increased for him as much as uh, it seems that it might for everybody else for people to have that much stock of batik, but um, very, very well-known um, iris. And this is just a, um, the buds uh, are, are even beautiful. No two flowers are alike, of course, like most uh, um, all uh, broken color irises. And so this is just another uh, photo of batik. And this is Alan in his garden, um, a wonderful person, um, very, very quiet, introverted until he got up in front of a group and then he could talk um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a while. Um, a very interesting person. He died at the age of 98 in 2010. Um, interesting little story. He worked for um, a great number of years trying to get a, a, an iris that he would name for his wife, Gladys. And um, he started working, I think he introduced his first uh, iris going for a pink amina with red beards. And he introduced that first one in 1957. And uh, somewhere in the um, 80s, I think, uh, mid to late 80s or something, he came up with one that was pretty good, not quite where he wanted, so he called it Almost Gladys. And then um, it got to be 1998, he introduced uh, one that he actually called Gladys My Love. And in the ad, in the AIS bulletin, when it was advertised uh, that year for, for sale, he wrote, this, is, this iris is not perfect, but then neither is Gladys. But for 64 years, she has been perfect enough for me. So uh, that was his sense of humor. He was, he was a uh, uh, wonderful person. 
And then others started working with uh, a broken color. This is from Brad Kasparic. And as we mentioned, Maria Tormina was uh, one of the parents of tiger honey that Brad introduced in 1994. And another that he introduced that same year, 1994, was Baboon Bottom. And this is a border bearded iris. And again, Mar Maria Tormina was a parent, um, won the Knowlton Medal in 2002. And then uh, the last group that I'm going to talk about tonight are space age irises, just a little bit, just kind of a, uh, uh, an introduction for Bonnie in the, the first couple weeks in, in August. Um, this is Unicorn from Lloyd Austin, 1954. It was the very first horned iris to be introduced. And uh, Lloyd Austin did a great, great deal for um, um, space age irises that he called them. Uh, plume delight. It was horned and often spooned. And uh, a photo of Lloyd. He was a professor at UC Davis, and then he was the first director of the Institute of Forest Genetics at Placerville. He had uh, great achievements in hybridizing, first in arils and arrow breads, and then with rebloomers, and then he went on to space age irises. Um, and the Novelty Iris Society, which Bonnie Nichols is uh, uh, the first, uh, and so far the only president um, yet uh, for the Novelty Iris Society, is a legacy, in part because of Lloyd Austin's work. And then he, uh, he had flounced premier in 1961, which is a progeny of Plume Delight, and Spooned Blaze, um, 1965. And then Skyhooks came along by Manly Osborne, 1980. And uh, this was a grandchild of Spooned Blaze, which we just saw. Skyhooks was another one of those uh, transitional irises. Uh, the numbers of um, space age irises that have Skyhooks in the background uh, would be uh, a phenomenal number of those irises. Uh, Little Bighorn from Monty Byers. Um, in 1989 was an intermediate bearded iris with sky hooks in the background. And then um, there was a, a series of Dykes medal winning irises from Monty Byers. This is Thornbird, 1989. Um, it was a tall bearded with sky hooks in the background. And Monty's uh, Moonshine Gardens catalog said, um, to say not everyone will care for this is probably an understatement. Uh, it's not what even I could call very pretty, but it has something that always makes me pause. Most strange with a kind of predatory presence, I think, especially uh, when it sports dark, uh, jaggedy appendages. So uh, even, even Monty in his catalog noted that everyone wouldn't, wouldn't like it and that uh, he wasn't even sure about it. But he said it was pretty good in all other respects. It went ahead, it won the dikes. And it is one of those irises, you either really love it or you hate it. I happen to really, really like Thornbird. And then Conjuration in 1989 uh, by Monty. Um, it's a tall bearded with sky hooks in its background, won the dikes in 98. And finally, Mesmerizer, which we had talked about earlier. Um, this one has sky hooks in the background and um, won, the, won the dikes in 2002. It's a great white iris in addition to being a, uh, um, a space age iris. Um, and Monty said in his Moonshine Gardens catalog, it consistently sports its flounces the most beautiful flounces I've ever seen. And unfortunately, uh, all three of these um, Dykes Medal winners uh, that Monty Byers received um, all came after his untimely death. And he never, he never knew about any of those um, uh, Dykes Medal uh, winning uh, wins that he had with his, his irises. So that's where I, I'm um, stopping for tonight. I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, uh, as I mentioned, there is a lot that I've left out. 
and there's a great deal that uh, leaves uh, space for people to um, uh, fill in some of the some of the uh, the blank spots. Thank you, Gary. And now we're going to go into some questions. So if anybody has questions, now is the time. Um, we went over time quite a bit, um, but uh, I think Gary was so good. We enjoyed it and loved it. So thank you, Gary. And um, uh, if there are no questions, I want to share something, uh, which is the flyer of the entire webinar series. And give me a second here. And um, I saw a question, has the genome of virus been sequenced? Um, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. Um, that's something that um, um, I'd have to look into. To uh, and, and Gary, uh, you stopped at, um, so it didn't go all the way to current times. Right. Are, are you planning to continue this uh, uh, program maybe uh, next year or in the future? And wh where are you with that? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I haven't really uh, thought about that. You know, when I, when I was uh, going to do the program at the New York Botanic Garden, it was, uh, it was kind of a combination of these two, two sessions and, um, uh, it, it was never really intended to to go up completely to the modern um, irises the last 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. But um, th there's a great deal of um, incredible work uh, that's been done in the last 25 years, and um, um, so there there's a possibility, yeah, that um, I could do something something in a year or so. Um, I was going to make a joke when you talked about colchicine. Um, uh, basically, your warning was about not using it in a person, uh, perhaps in a novel. If someone's writing a novel, they can use it, right? And they can use yeah. it for irises and for people, and uh, but not in reality. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. You know, you know the book, uh, um, uh, Iris Red, Iris Dead. Uh, uh -huh. but, uh, you know, maybe. Um, um, he could write a second uh, novel using colchicine. A part two, or a part two, yeah. Sequel, a sequel. So everyone, I just wanted to show you the. I uh, hope you can see the calendar here. Uh, so we're taking a couple of weeks off. We're coming back on August fifth with Bonnie Nichols on novel T. Irises, broken collar and flatties. And that includes the judges' training. And then on August 12th, again, uh, Bonnie with um, Space Agers. So that should be very good. And then again in September, Jody is going to do the species irises with a JT training as well. I saw a, com a question somebody asked what are the com uh, chromosome counts of different types of viruses? Um, that varies a great deal depending on what uh, species of viruses that the irises are coming from. Um, as I, me I mentioned, the chromosomes for Siberian irises, there's a 28 chromosome group, which is pretty much all that I talked about. Um, but then there's a whole series of 40 chromosomes, Siberians. Um, so, and then spurrier irises, had, there's, uh, uh, depending on the species, there's uh, a quite, a, quite a range of chromosome numbers, uh, counts in those. Um, That's correct, yeah. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of work, uh, I'm going to plug in the Spiria Iris Society, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. There's, uh, I think the maximum chromosome count on Spirias is 72, and um, so, but it hasn't been used hardly with, 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 uh, with the other, the, nor the regular um, Spirias that we see. Um, and then uh, there's a question about what are you seeing as the last trends in hybridizing viruses? It's everywhere. I mean, there are so many, um, uh, there, there are a lot of great um, um, uh, trends in, in viruses with the bearded, our tall beardeds. Uh, I didn't even talk about uh, placatas, for instance, um, and 
Keith Keppel's work and and all of that. There's a just a uh, a uh, huge amount of work in placatas, and they're actually pretty complicated, and that's one of the reasons I didn't really get into it, because there are uh, fancy placatas and uh, placata aminas and, you know, all sorts of, of things. And um, um, and then in other irises, you know, there are dark tops and um, uh, ju just a lot of, uh, of groundbreaking um, um, trends in, in hybridizing uh, bearded irises. In beardless uh, with Siberians, uh, in in the the next 25 years, you know, um, you get into uh, just a, a phenomenal number of color breaks uh, from Schaefer Sachs, uh, from um, uh, Marty Schaefer and Jan Sachs, and Diploid uh, Siberians. They're, they have um, uh, just come up with just a huge number of um, uh, great color breaks in Siberians. And then you get uh, uh, very large Siberians that Bob Hollingworth has been, you know, just in the last few years working with. And one of those um, um, just won the Dykes uh, uh, two, three years ago, Swans in Flight. Right. Um, and it's a, it's a huge flower. And then I think he just came out with another, If Swans Were Blue, another really large uh, uh, Siberian that's uh, rivaling the, the size of uh, tall bearded flowers. So, um, and then, you know, uh, Spurrias, there's, there's been a, you know, um, Nicewanger has been trying to get pink uh, Spurrias for a number of years. Um, Louisiana's have just an incredible uh, uh, variety of um, um, colors in and, uh, and people working on them, uh, not only in this country, but in um, around, you know, in Australia, um, some um, great Siberian or uh, um, Louisiana hybridizers there. Uh, Pacific Coast, uh, there, there are just um, an amazing number of um, uh, changes and hybridizing goals and things being realized in, in a number of uh, irises and of course medians. There's a message from uh, Jan Sachs. She's right here. She's watching. Uh, in 1999, Cigna published its alphabetical list of virus species in Cigna Checklist Part 1. This gives the chromosome counts uh, for most of this iris species. You may want to find this information on the Cigna, uh, in the wiki. Oh, thank you, Jan. That's, that's great information. So um, thank you everyone for um, showing up tonight. We uh, love it that you're able to join us. Uh, Gary, thank you so much. And everyone, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, have a good um, rest of July and um, hope that uh, you stay healthy and uh, that, um, you know, stay at home. <laughs> uh, one thing I did want to mention is that, uh, you know, the, the um, supplements to the AIS bulletin that have been coming out, we've had two of them and the third one is finished and we'll be coming out with the um, um, July issue of the bulletin. Um, and then there will be a fourth one in the fall. Um, those have a great deal of information as well. And um, uh, but there are uh, still a lot of stories untold. And uh, so maybe some of these webinars or some other people get involved in doing these, we can fill in some of that, some of that information. Um, I, I just, one little, little, little note, um, the Jan wrote a, uh, Jan Sachs wrote a wonderful piece for the one that's coming out um, in a few weeks on uh, uh, Siberian irises and the uh, all of the changes that have happened uh, mostly since um, 1950 as this session was and uh, so I want to thank Jan just because I, I actually stole some of her um, uh, points along the way to put in it so <laughs> um, that was very helpful Jan. Good idea. Okay everyone thank you and good night see you soon. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you Gary bye-bye. Good night, everyone.